church. That's a small town church. It's barren, right? Thank God for that, huh? Okay. So, <clears throat> anyway, good business at hand. Uh, today is going to be more of just talking than more of a sermon, right? Because I have not preached as much. Lord willing, we'll get our message across. And I pray about, of course, me and I pray about what I'm going to talk about and this and that. Lord told me a couple of weeks ago to pray about it. This is kind of what God laid on my heart. It's going to be short. It's going to be simple. But uh, what we're going to do at first is we're going to cover we're going to cover a little ground that we cover fairly regular, but I think it's going to be germane to the point I'm going to try to make. So since we don't have a paper today, I'm going to start off. You guys just follow along best you can. We're going to start off in um, 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 6, right? And, and what's happening here is the, is the disciples had come to Jesus and asked him, you know, tell us, Tell us when the end's going to come. Tell us what's going to happen. So we're going to pick it up in verse 6, 24th chapter of Matthew. And Jesus said, And you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled. For all of these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Moving on to 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. All of these things in verse 8 are the beginning of sorrow. Now, when he describes what's going on, you know, I mean, you, you, it, it's fairly obvious, right? So I, it, it's my firm belief that we are living in the time Jesus described as the beginning of sorrows. I, I don't think anyone, I don't think you can dispute that. I don't think you can doubt it. I know people in generations past that said, well, we're there, we're there, we're there, you know, but everything wasn't in place. Israel was not in their land. The Jews did not have control of Jerusalem. That happened in 1967, right? That was that is a major sign. The Bible says that Jerusalem will be downtrodden by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is complete. So when the Jews took back over control of Jerusalem, that happened in 1967, that was a major sign to us that the time of the Gentiles was complete, right? Well, you realize that was 55 years ago almost, okay? So everything in, in when, when we talk about the, the last days, the end times, it's all portrayed as a one generational thing. In other words, the last days, the end times, it's not going to stretch on for 200 years. Okay? Because Jesus said that the generation that sees these things come to pass, which included Israel coming into the land, which included them taking over Jerusalem, which includes all these other things we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Jesus said whoever sees all of these signs... We'll see him come back. We will see the culmination of all these events, right? So that tells us either within a biblical generation, which is about 80 years, but we're pushing 80 years right now since the Jews came back, or that some of those people will still be alive. You could go either way. I'm, I'm not positive on it, but either way it can't be long, right? Because we're pushing 80 years, okay? So I think we're, we're establishing the fact that uh, – if you look at the signs, if you look at the things that he talked about, I mean, if you look what's going on, with, you know, he talked about rumors of wars, wars and rumors of wars. Well, I mean, look what's going on in Europe again. We have war, major war in Europe going on right now, first time in 80 years. You got rumors of wars. You know, you got, you got the, the Chinese threatening Taiwan. You have the Iranians threatening Israel. You know, you got Russia threatening to nuke us. So we have rumors of wars. We have famines. You know, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention. But we are being warned that there is a food shortage coming. And we're already starting to see beginnings of that, right? You're starting to go to the store. Never in my lifetime in the United States of America have I gone to the store and there not be something there we wanted. But you can go to the store regularly now, and whatever you're looking for may not be there. Now, for us, that's, just, that's an inconvenience, right? I don't know that, that we're very soon going to see famine in the United States, but we may see shortages of things. But they're talking about major Famines of biblical proportions coming into Africa, coming into other parts of the world, coming into South America. And you think a famine in South America ain't going to affect us here? You need to think again because then people are going to come up here by the billions then, right? So we see those things coming. We're being warned right now that those things are coming. Pestilence, one of the signs he talks about is pestilence. Well, as, as you know, Bo was just saying now, we got new diseases on the rise. We got, you know, we have, we have, every time you look up, it's something else. Now, bear in mind, a lot of them are really nasty, but I think a lot of them are also being used to push a fear factor, Amen. right? I think there's a spirit of fear moving into the world, and I think a lot of this stuff is being, is, is, is being used, you know? They, you know what they say, never let a crisis go to waste, right? So, anyway, 
point I'm making is, and, and I don't even have to get you guys started about earthquakes. You can't turn on the radio today without an earthquake being happening somewhere. The point I'm trying to make is all the things that Jesus said to look for in the end of days at the last time, we're watching it happen in front of us. So I can stand here, and I would never get up here and say, I may say something wrong, but it would be because I was mistaken. I will never get up here and intentionally tell you something that I know that I don't believe in my heart to be true. And I can honestly believe, tell you I believe in my heart, we are living deep within the beginning of sorrows. We are living deep within that time that Jesus said he called the birth pains, right? In, in, in Mark, he called, they call them birth pains. 24 chapter of Matthew, he calls them the beginning of sorrows. Well, if, if you look at birth pains and you start looking at it from that way, once birth pains start, once the birth starts, you may have false birth pains, I suppose. But once the birth starts, it doesn't stop, right? Now, you ladies, correct me if I'm wrong. You're going to have a, you can have a major contraction, which, by the way, I feel like the whole COVID thing, two years of COVID, in my mind, this is my opinion, that was a birth pain. That was a major worldwide contraction, right? I think that was a major serious birth pain, the whole thing, okay? So that was probably just the first one. So what happens after that? Then you get a little lull at the beginning stages, right? You have a little time, everything will calm down, right? And, and then another one comes, and it's even worse, and it's, it's more serious, right? And then after that, a little less time happens, and another one comes, and it's even more serious than that. point I'm making is we can expect another birth pain around the corner. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know how it's going to be used or how they're going to take advantage of it. But we can expect that, dude. We can expect it. I mean, you just look for it. It's coming. I don't think we're ever going to go back to what we considered normal prior to a few years ago, prior to when we were kids. We're not going to go back to that. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 the, the snowball has started rolling down the hill, and it ain't going to get pushed back up, right? So it, we've established that we, I think we're in the middle, I think we're in the beginning of sorrows. So that reminds me of like a, a, a prairie fire or something. You can see the smoke over the horizon. You know a fire's coming. Well, if we can see that we're in the beginning of far, sorrows, we know the tribulation is not far off. It can't be. Because as I said earlier, it's pretty well established in the Bible that that's a one-generational thing. It's going to happen. When it starts happening, it's going to happen. And then, it, and then once the floodgate opens, it really happens. You know, it, it's, it's like, and, and basically we're at, a, we're at a point where I think the floodgate is pretty well getting open, right? Yeah. The levee is breaking. It's leaking more all the time. So we know that we, we are, the, the tribulation is, is just right around the corner. So I'm going to read a little bit right here in Revelations verse 13 and 17. And this is talking about the Antichrist, right? Because if you stop and look at all the things going on, I think, it's, I think it's pertinent. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Okay, well, that right there, all kindreds, tongues, and nations, that means that power was given to him over the whole world, right? It's not a regional thing. It's not like the, uh, the European Union, he's going to rule over there, Putin's going to rule over here, yada, yada, yada. No. His power is given to this guy. Now, bear in mind, before he is, before he's revealed, I honestly believe the Bible teaches will be gone. Okay, Amen. because the the Scripture tells us that he who restrains, he who the evil one can't be revealed until he who restrains is taken out of the way. The he who restrains, the restrainer, is the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Antichrist and evil cannot just go unabounded as long as the Holy Spirit is in the world. The Holy Spirit resides in his church. He resides in the heart of believers. He said that I will never leave you. So common sense should tell you that if he is taken out of the way, we have to be taken out of the way too, right? If he goes, we got to go with him because he said he will never leave us. He is a part of us. So before the Antichrist is actually revealed in the world, before he steps up to the plate and starts doing his really, really nasty business, we're going to be gone. Okay, but... It, it, it's really not that far out. I mean, it's not, if you pay attention, and I'm like a news junkie, eventually I had to quit watching it so much just because it will make you crazy. A guy told me that one time, and it's true. If you watch, and especially I would imagine if you don't have a biblical worldview and you don't really look at things for what, what they really are, it would just, it would just dishearten you so much you'd want to jump off the water tower or something. You know what I'm saying? 
it, seriously, but um, as a Christian, we know the end game. We know in the end we win. We know all this stuff is coming. And, 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 but think about the lost world. I mean, even for us as Christians, we know this stuff is coming. We've been told it was coming. I was raised in church my entire life. I've been told my entire life that I may live to see this stuff happen. And yet, as we're watching it happen in front of us, it still amazes me. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's, things are still on a scale. And the, the, the point I'm trying to make is we just getting started. Okay? Uh, if, if you, I don't know if you guys ever pay attention to what they call the World Economic Forum. Okay? This is a group of billionaires who I honestly think at the very higher levels they are satanically inspired. I really do. These are the George Soros types of people. These are these kind of people that have this God complex. They got all the money in the world. They think they are so much better than any of us that we're nothing but mere peasants. Okay, well, they got this group called the WEF, World Economic Forum. They meet every year at a place called Davos, Switzerland, to discuss how we need to be ruled. They are the people that are pushing the one world government. I know you've all heard of that, that we just established the antichrist is going to be over. Okay? So these people have already established, and they don't even try to hide it anymore. They've already established they want a one world government by the year 2030. Whether they're going to make it by 2030 or not, we don't know. Any of this, I mean, this could be a five-year plan. This could be, a, it could be 15 more years. But I think if I live my natural lifespan out, I think I'll live to see the rapture of the church. That, that's, that's my hope anyway. So anyway, these people are pushing for a one world government. They want to establish it by the, by the year 2030. And if you guys will stop and remember back 30 years ago, first George Bush coined the term a new world order. You remember that back in like 1988, 89, 90, somewhere? We are going to move to a new world order. Well, that's 30-something years ago. Well, that seems like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, they were just basically, basically just announcing it. So what we see is a move, a, a drive towards getting rid of nation states, a drive away from nationalism and a drive toward a one world system. That one world system is the system that the Antichrist is going to ride on. Okay? So that he's going to have the ability to control in the in the tribulation, mind you. They're going to have the ability to control all your financial transactions. Right? We're going to do away with cash, it looks like. We're going to probably move to a digital currency. People always say, well how can he control how can you con how how can they control how can they control all your buying and selling? You, you, you guys all know the verse I'm talking about. He causes all both great and small to take a mark in his right hand or his forehead, so you can neither buy nor sell except you have the mark. Well, people have always said forever. Well, how can they do that? Well, I'm telling you something. The technology is here now. The technology is here to do it. A lot of us don't realize. Back in March, our president, and for better or worse, he is our president gave a directive to uh, many of our agencies to come up within 200 days to come up with a plan to move the United States from March the 9th, I think he issued the directive, executive order. 200 days to come up with a plan, that's not to say to institute it, but to come up with a plan to move the United States toward a digital currency. Okay, now what you, if you stop and think about that, uh, that, ha that has, could have some very serious implications. So look what happened in Canada when those truckers were protesting and Justin Trudeau cut off all their money because all their money was digital. Closed all their bank accounts, froze everything up. Once we move to a digital currency and you have no more cash, that can happen like that, right? We already saw a precursor to you not being able to buy and sell Last year, or was it year before last? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to fault the vaccine, anyone that took it. It did a lot of people a lot of good. I don't have a problem with it. I didn't take it myself. I don't think I needed it. The problem I had with it was them telling us we have to take it, right? And if you, do, if you guys will remember, we were praying in church every week, my wife and I, and bringing up a prayer in church. They basically said, if you don't do this, we're going to cut you out of society. You won't be able to go to a store and buy nothing. We're going to we're gonna cut you. are not going to be able to have a job, Okay. Imagine how much worse that's going to be when you have no goggle eyes in your pocket, when it's all digital, when your bank account can be shut off right now. Not only, not only are they going to have the ability to shut it off if they want to, it'll also be programmable money. They will be able to program. They will say, for instance, Junior, you used 
a little too much gas last week. Your carbon footprint is too big. So you, your account cannot buy gas until the first. That is possible. I, was, I watched this, the lady explained it the other day at Dodgers. They will be, we'll be able to control what you buy and what you don't. And, and, and they say they are this close to having the ability to track every transaction made anywhere. The point, and, and this is not even the major point I'm trying to make, but the point is we, we, it, we are not very far. We can see the tribulation on the horizon. We can see the rapture of the church coming. Thank God he's going to take us out before it gets too bad. Amen. Right? Amen. But how bad is it going to get before that? Okay? Things are not great right now. If we look back to when we were kids, you know, I'm looking at Tush, Trab, Boone. When we're looking at when we were kids in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and you guys, you know, life, life was pretty good. If you look at the life then, or you look at life even 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, compared to what it is right now, you know, if you were to come back right now, my dad been dead 37 years. If he came back right now, he would not recognize the world we live in right now. I barely recognize it from 10 years ago. So the point is, at, with the acceleration of the way things are going, and, and how much, where do you think we're going to be in five years? If the rapture doesn't happen for another five or six or 10 years, which is entirely possible, how bad are things going to get before he comes and gets us? He says we won't go through the tribulation, but he never said we ain't going to go through some tribulation prior to it. We're not going to face the wrath of God. Don't make no mistake. The tribulation period, that seven-year period, especially the last three and a half years, is the wrath of God on the earth, on an unbelieving world. But God says we're not appointed to wrath. We're not going to see that. But the point of what I'm trying to say today is we could see some really bad stuff prior to that, okay? Things could get really touchy prior to him coming back. So what, what I think is, is, is what's going to have to happen, just about losing my place here, is that as Christians, we're really going to have to learn to trust God's promises, okay? And I know intellectually, we all know that. Intellectually, you read the Bible, you know it's the truth, right? We know that. But we're going to have to learn to not only just believe that in our heart, we're going to have to learn to embrace that, and we're going to have to learn to live by that, right? Because we're going to get to a point where you can't rely on the economy. Our economy, I don't care what you watched on the news last night, our economy is not good, okay? And it's going to get worse, I think. And, and, and as Christians, we're going to start facing more and more animosity from the world. The world, don't, don't, don't get wrong, if you're a Christian, you stand up for Jesus, and you are adamant about your beliefs, and you don't cow down, people hate you. i got people look at me jacked up all the time. They look at me like I'm an idiot. They laugh in my face. This, and, but you know what? There's going to come a day when they're going to find out we were right. So as time goes on, as Christians, and I'm saying this am amongst your friends and even amongst your family, you know, I'm, I'm talking about your family who's supposed to love you. You're going to find, I think we're going to find that they're going to more and more disassociate. If they're not Christian you are, they're not going to want to be around you. And a lot of it is because when they're living in darkness and you're shining a light, well, what happens? The darkness wants to run from the light. They don't want the light shined on them lest their deeds be made manifest. You living right and you shining the light of the gospel is going to shine a light on people who are not and it shines a light on the way they're living their life, and that makes them uncomfortable, so they don't want to be around you. Yeah. So the longer they want to be around you, they're going to convince themselves there's something wrong with you. Because if there ain't nothing wrong with you, there must be something wrong with them. So the longer things goes on, the longer we go, I think the more you're going to see a deterioration in some of those relationships. The best thing we can do is pray for these people. Pray for your unsaved family members. Pray for your friends. Because the deeper and the closer we get to the actual rapture of the church, the closer we get to that, I think you're going to see an opening up of a distance. I think the lines are being drawn, and, and, and you know, the, the, the delusion, I honestly think the great delusion that God talked about is going out into the world right now. I think, we're seeing, I think it's going to get exponentially worse after the rapture of the church, but I think we're starting to see the beginnings of it. So we're, we're going to increasingly face animosity and, and, and probably even outright hostility from the world, excuse me, 
as we move further and deeper into what we call the beginning of Star Wars. So what the, the main point of what I'm trying to say today is we are going to get to a point where we are going to have nothing else to, and I'm talking about for our day-to-day -day needs, okay? If we're all saved, if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus, when you leave this world, you know where you're going, right? Trav, two seconds after you leave this world, you're going to be walking on the streets of gold, and you ain't scared of it, right? Okay, but I'm talking about for our day-to-day -day sustainment from now till then. We're going to get to a point where we're going to have nothing else to hang our hopes on except the promises that God gives us in his word. Because the economy is terrible. You could walk in tomorrow and your job could be over. You could go in there and don't think, don't think, it, don't, don't think it can't happen. You could have been somewhere 40 years and you could walk in tomorrow and say, you know, we declared bankruptcy. I'm sorry, we lost your pension. You're out. It can happen. Okay. Uh, it can get to the point, I mean, gas is getting to the point where you can't, you can't hardly afford to drive anywhere anymore. What did our senator say the other day? Uh, it's cheaper to buy cocaine in Louisiana than it is gas. You know, so he said we'd be better off buying cocaine and just running everywhere. It's cheaper than gas. Now, what, I digress whether that's true or not, but it was funny. So the point I'm making is the further we go, the more we're going to have to start relying on God's promises. But the fact of the matter is, he puts them right here in his, he, he puts them in his word. And I've got a notebook at my house that I've got like three pages that I wrote. I didn't write it all out for this, but I find I retain knowledge better if I write it down, right? So back after the hurricane, when a tornado killed my house and everybody's telling me, oh, you ain't going to get no money for it. You know, that trailer's 25 years old. Ain't nobody giving you nothing for that. You are, you're just so, and I, so I went and I started writing down all the promises of God sustaining you. And if I write them down, like I say, I can, I can, and I still carry that. I have it in my knapsack for my computer case that I take to work every day. And it's just, it's probably got 40 to 50 different verses in there where God promises to sustain it. And by the way, we came out really well. Okay, I had a 25-year-old trailer house that everybody told me I wasn't going to get $10,000 for. They paid me more than twice what I paid for it brand new. Amen. All right? Because we refused to believe anything else. I told everybody, we're just going to pray. I prayed every day for eight weeks about it. Amen. They gave me more than twice what I paid for it. Okay? So that was strictly because we were being faithful and I refused to believe anything else. Amen. So the point I'm making is we are probably going to be pushed into situations where you're not going to, there's going to be nothing else for you to grab onto, right? I'm talking about all the way from buying your groceries to paying your house note, to paying the light bill, to having a job, to doing whatever you want. But listen to this. Thankfully, these promises are still, can you guys hear me when I get away from there? I just realized I got a lot louder right there. These promises are still in effect, but we're going to go back to uh, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to go to, I'm going to read out of 31, and I'm going to read on down to 34 for just a minute. Just listen to this. It says, therefore, take no thought, which means don't worry. It doesn't mean don't consider tomorrow, don't plan for tomorrow. When it says take no thought, it means don't sit up at night fretting and worrying. That's what that means, right? It says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things to the Gentiles seek. Now in this context, the Gentiles were any, is anybody who's not saved. For, for our purposes, when it's talking about Gentiles, that's talking about unsaved, the world. Okay, We're not of the world. We're Christian. We're not of the world. We live in the world. We're not of it. For the, after these things to the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, once again, that means don't worry. That doesn't mean don't, that mean I'm still saying pay in your 401k, because who knows, right? But it means don't worry about tomorrow. Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There's going to be enough problems come up tomorrow. You just need to worry about today. We're going to get to a point, I think, where when you get up every day in the morning, you really have to take this into your heart. Sincerely, Lord, give me today what I need to get. Okay, give me what you need me to have today. I need to work today, give me some work today. I need to make some money today, Lord, i got to pay this. Give me some money today. Like I said, it doesn't mean to not plan for the future. It just means don't worry yourself to death about it. And I think as time goes on, this is going to become more and more real to us. I mean, growing up, coming to church, you know, like I say, intellectually we all, we hear these things and you know they're all true. But it's fixing to really get real I think in the next few years. I, I really do. I really think it's going to be that. But thankfully, you'll notice he didn't say 
don't worry about tomorrow until we get really close to the tribulation. He didn't say that. He didn't say, don't worry about tomorrow until the beginning of sorrows. Then you kind of No, he didn't say that. That promise is as real today. It will be as real next year. It will be as real the year after that as it was the day he said it. Right? My point I'm making is cling to that as we go through, as we move forward. Things are going to get tight. You're, I mean, you're going to probably be able to even help other people. You know, cling to God's promises. He promises he will take care of us. He tells us not to worry. And human nature is to worry. Nobody does more than, you know, I, I, like, I would like to stand up here and say I don't ever worry. I'm not thinking, no. I, this is a lesson that I've been learning here the last few months, okay? And I think maybe that's why God put this on my heart to talk about this tonight. This is a lesson he has been teaching me. My job is in a state of flux right now. Our company's in a state of flux. We're kind of changing directions. i got to pray every day, Lord. I need to work tomorrow. I need to work tomorrow. And tomorrow, every day, there's something for me to do. And that's all I can cling to. And as I look back over it over the last few months, maybe that's why it's been that way, so I could learn this lesson so I could get up here today and share it with you guys. You know, it could be. But I'm also reminded, I, I, I don't know if you guys have ever read, and I know Russell's talked about it before in 1 Kings 17, and I'm not going to read all the scripture, but it's the story of Elijah and the widow. You guys know what I'm talking about? There was a famine in the land. Uh, Elijah, God tells Elijah, go meet this widow. She's going to take care of you. He, he goes and he meets her, goes to this certain town. He meets the widow. He tells her, get me a drink of water. She gives him water. He says, well, make me a cake. She said, well, look, all I got is enough for one little pancake. I'm gathering up a couple sticks. We're going to cook that, and then me and my son are going to die because we don't have anything else. Well, Elijah, Elijah basically tells her, it, it, to paraphrase, is God told me to come here, and you need to do what he wants you to do, so make me a pancake. I'm hungry. So in obedience to God, not to Elijah, she makes him the last little bit of meal she has in her pancake, in her barrel, all right? And she's as done as everybody else. Her and her son are just going to lay over and die. Now, that's pretty tight. I don't know if we'll ever see that in the United States, but principle remains the same. But because she was faithful to what God said, her little barrel for the rest of that famine, until God sent rain again, always had enough for their next meal. Amen. It never ran out. She never had an abundance. She never had 40 barrels where she had to build bigger barns. But she always had enough for them to eat today. Amen. Every time they dug in it, there was always flour. There was always oil. In it. The point making is, even with nothing, what looked like nothing, God sustained that woman through several more years of famine, okay, because of her faithfulness to his word. That's the kind of faith that we're going to have to learn to build. There's going to come a day when you're going to have to look, God, Lord, I have no other choice. I need your help. I don't know what we're going to do, right? It, so it's, it, we're going to have to take these promises basically at face value, we're going to have, we know that they're true. We're going to have to learn to trust that they're true. Because, like I say, thing, things, are, things are going to get tough, you know. Things, things could get really tough before he comes back and get them. But Proverbs 3, 5 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path, right? So when you get to those points where you don't know what you're going to do, and we don't know where our light bill is going to get paid, and we don't know what's going to happen next week, Remember that. Trust him with all your heart. Lord, I need your help. I need you to direct my... You need to show me the way that I need to go. And he says that he will do it. And how do we know that he will do it? Because he says so. Because in Romans 10, 17, it tells us that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. Right? That's where you build your faith. So I went for a long time. I did not read my Bible regularly like I should have. Right? And that is a huge hindrance to your faith. I have found out the last couple years, last few years, I make it a habit to read every day. And this, this verse is as true as any of the other promises. But the, 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 biggest, the best part about this is as you're reading the other promises, now they're in your mind. When you get in a bind, when things get tight, when things get tough, God brings these promises back to your mind. If you wouldn't, if you would never have read them, you wouldn't know them, right? right. So he's going to bring these promises back to your mind. And God does not lie. He cannot lie. There are things God can't do, right? He can't lie. He can't not be holy. He can't not do what he told you he's going, what he promised you to do. 
So he promised to take care of you. He pro and he tells you don't even worry. You know, think about this. If your if your child, you know, we all love our kids or your grandkids, would get up every day, you know, when they were little kids and come to you, Daddy, I, I don't know what we're going to eat tomorrow. I don't know where I'm going to sleep. What's going? How would that make you feel as a dad? You tell your son, you don't worry about that. That's for me to worry about. You go on to school, go out and play and have fun and be a kid. That's for me to worry about. You know. So think how much God feels the same way because God is your dad, right? So for us to question whether or not he's going to take care of us, for us to constantly worry, for us to constantly worry, that's, that's, it's in a way of being unfaithful and telling God, we don't know if you're going to do what you said you're going to do, if you're capable. Well, he is capable, and he is going to do it. So think about the last time God, it, there's a song that comes to mind, I hear it on Caleb all the time. When's the last time he failed to fulfill one of his promises? He never has and never will. He's still in control which is basically the, the whole point, the gist of what I'm trying to say. As we're moving deeper into the beginning of sorrows, we're watching the world burn down around us. I mean, lawlessness is out of control. You know, things are just going to get exponentially worse. Always remember, he is still in control. And he will sustain us one way or another. You know, we might be eating coons and possums, but we can eat. God's children, he's never seen them begging bread. Right? We might have to catch fish. We might have, well, if i got to catch fish, we're going to be in fine. But my buddy over here can catch every fish that ever swam. So I'm going to be okay. So, but just remember that he is in control. Now, we're going to kind of wrap up today. I am going to wrap up with one little verse Russ uses a lot. Um, but I think it's always relevant. For whosoever shall call, pain, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? So if you're not saved, all these promises, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, people, you know, you ever hear everybody say, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. Yeah. The, Jesus himself said you're not. He told the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. Yeah. He said, whoever is not for me is against me. Right? So if you are not born again, saved by the blood of Jesus, I'm sorry, you are not a child of God. These promises do not apply to you. Yeah. Thankfully, if you're saved, you're born again, these promises do apply to you, and they are just as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago when he made them and 2,000 years from now, Amen. right? They are eternal. They will always be there, and I'm just saying I would just, I, we're going to have to learn to exercise our faith. We're going to have to learn to hold on to that and to believe in that, right? Amen. Okay, if you guys stand up, we'll have a prayer, then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Lord, Father, I want to thank you today, Lord, for this little message we had and, and hope that it was what you wanted, Father, and, and that we take it to heart, Lord, and learn to, learn to live for your promises. Lord, we ask that you uh, go with us today as we go on our way. Thank you for everybody here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All you bigs. All right. Everyone, please, y'all are standing. Huh?